That's Professor Tim Tate from the University of Irvine. Some background on Tim. <clears throat> he got his PhD in Michigan State. He did a postdoc at Fermi Lab and another one at Argonne National Laboratory. He was hired as a junior faculty at Argonne National Laboratory at Northwestern University. <clears throat> and then he moved to UC Irvine, where he's been a Chancellor's Fellow professorship Professor, and he's now the chair of the physics department at UC Irvine. In 2016, he received the Frederick Wilhelm Bessel Fellowship from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. This is, anybody outside Germany can get this, except for there's about 20 per year across all disciplines. So it's pretty prestigious. And most recently, he's become the convener for the cosmology frontier for the Snowmass Community Study. The Snowmass Community Study, for those who don't know, is about every five to 10 years, the particle physics community gets together and kind of decides what it wants to do in the long term. So being a convener of this is a pretty big deal. And he's an expert who's made a lot of very important contributions to our understanding of particle dark matter. So I think that's what he's going to tell us about today. Thank you very much. <laughs> and sorry for the technical problems. It's the problem in a world where everything works the first time you plug it in, that when it doesn't, you have absolutely no idea what to do. Oh, and I'm a theoretical physicist, so whatever that's worth. Um, so yeah, I'm here to tell you about searches for particle dark matter. Uh, I'm going to start with the most important uh, piece of information that this colloquium contains. This animal is an anteater. <laughs> this is actually a better mascot, <laughs> but this one is pretty particular. <coughs> and I was pretty amazed to learn uh, that uh, at least two members of your faculty uh, were undergraduates at UCI, and they therefore they are also anteaters. Um, it's, uh, well, it, it matches our personality. That's, I guess, the best I can say about that mascot. <laughs> so I'm going to talk today about particle dark matter and how I think about that as a theoretical particle physicist. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is going to have to do with experiments. I'm not actually someone who does the experiments themselves, uh, but I am someone who actually tries to put the experiments together and make a picture out of it. Um, so here's a brief outline. I'm going to start with some motivation for why it is that we need dark matter. Uh, not very much about that, actually, because I'm not really an expert on that particular aspect of it, but a little bit to remind us how things work. Um, and then talk a little bit uh, about why weakly interacting massive particles are still, despite the fact that you can read in the New York Times that they're dead, not dead, uh, and um, an interesting candidate to talk about. Then, as a theoretical physicist, what my job is, in some sense, is to work on theoretical frameworks to talk about how dark matter interacts. I'll say a little bit about different kinds of theories, um, what this means will hopefully become clear as I go along, and then I'll finish up with some outlook. So dark matter is something that we know is required to make the universe that we see around us. Uh, it's something that we can infer the existence of based on measurements that take place at all different kinds of um, length scales on the universe. Uh, that's part of the reason, I think, why many of us believe that dark matter is the simple solution to all these observations. It is very hard, though not actually perhaps impossible, to come up with a theory that would simultaneously explain all these measurements, whereas just having a component of the universe that is not visible but has mass and is non-relativistic actually does a very good job of explaining at least the gross features of all of them. This is a very, very old plot uh, from the Supernova Cosmology Project. Uh, it's showing uh, the two axes here are the amount of matter in the universe, uh, normalized by the critical density, the amount of vacuum energy in the universe. There are three different classes of observations that are combined here. And again, this was actually something that was down around the early 2000s. Uh, you can see measurements from supernova, measurements from the CMB, and measurements from structure formation. They all more or less agree that we live in a universe that has a large component of both vacuum energy and matter. Uh, if you account for the ordinary matter, it's a tiny sliver of the matter that's actually required here. Uh, and then the dark energy makes up the biggest piece of the pie, but dark matter is about 20% of it or so. So dark matter is actually, in some sense, more important to make the universe than we are, um, though of course we're a little less invested in it. Um, why this very old plot? The reason is if you look at a modern version of this plot, the measurements are so precise and it's so zoomed in that you don't get the sense that actually these things did not really have to agree with each other. I actually started working on the subject of dark matter at about this time, and it's because I was really struck by the fact that when you have three different classes of measurements with different, you know, operating at different times in the universe, different systematics, different scales, 
it would sort of be a miracle <laughs> if they all agreed on one region, right? Either you've got the right theory to interpret it, uh, or it takes a miracle. So I don't think it's a miracle. I think it's that this is actually something telling us pretty solid about what we know about the universe. Of course, beyond that, it doesn't tell us anything at all. It just tells us that, that most of the universe is stuff that we don't know. So as a particle physicist, uh, my question is, what is dark matter? Uh, this is actually an interesting answer to that question that my brother-in-law found. Um, this is actually a sculpture by Cornelia Parker. The title is Cold Dark Matter, an Exploded View. So when I told him I was thinking about dark matter, uh, he's a banker, by the way. <laughs> he said, oh, that's OK. I know what that is. I took a picture of it. And here it is. Uh, <laughs> So it is actually a really wonderful sculpture. If you go and see it, it's three-dimensional. It's lit up from the inside. You can look at it from different angles. Um, there are two things that strike me about it. Uh, the first one is that it's such a wonderful image based on such a very incomplete picture that we can give the art world about what dark matter is. I would really like to see what the art world can produce if we could actually tell them what kind of particles they should be using to make their sculptures. Uh, and the second thing is that you can find it in the Tate Museum, but Tate is spelled incorrectly, so don't get confused. So um, this summarizes more or less what I said on the previous slide. It's really remarkable that all the measurements on different scales indicate a self-consistent picture of the universe. Uh, what I would like to do know is how to fit this into a model of particle physics. What I know about it is very modest. I know that it's dark, or in other words, electromagnetically <laughs> neutral. It doesn't shine. It's not golf balls for that reason. <laughs> Uh, it's massive, meaning it's actually not moving very fast. If it were moving too fast, it would not form the galaxies that we see. Uh, it's still around today, meaning that it's stable, or if it does decay, it's decaying very, very slowly, such that it has not decayed very much yet. Maybe not at all. <coughs> and putting those three properties together is enough to tell me that actually dark matter has to be physics beyond the standard model. Um, this is the table that we've all seen of uh, particles in the standard model. I'm not going to go through it in gory detail, right? There are the quarks that make up uh, protons, neutrons, et cetera. The leptons, including the electron, our favorite one. The four force carriers and the Higgs boson, of course, can be thought of as one of those. If you go through this table, the point that I have for this talk is that none of these particles actually have the right properties. Photons, leptons, Ws, the hadrons, meaning the, the quarks, they're all shining too brightly, or in the case of the photon, they are actually literally light. Neutrinos are too light. Ws, Zs, and Higgs bosons are too short-lived. They wouldn't be around today. So that tells me that dark matter is something outside of this table. It's a manifestation of physics beyond the standard model. And hopefully, its existence is telling me something about what I should add to this table in order to be able to describe it. That's, um, that's what I would like to know. Now, in order to do that, I have devised the dark matter questionnaire. If you see dark matter walking down uh, the street, please stop it and give it this questionnaire. Ask it to fill it out. Um, it's much better than political polling. So it includes all the information we know about dark matter, which is that it interacts with gravity. All of the probes we have so far are gravitational in nature. Uh, what we would like to know, though, is a lot of other things. For example, what's its mass? Does it have intrinsic quantum mechanical spin the way the electron does? Is it absolutely stable or just approximately stable? Then as far as its interactions, we know about gravity, like I just said, but does it feel the electroweak interaction? Does it talk to the Higgs boson? Does it get its mass from the Higgs boson the way everything else does? There's actually good reasons to think it probably doesn't. Um, does it interact with the quarks and the gluons that make up uh, the hadrons? Uh, does it talk to leptons? All of those things are questions that we'd like to have answers to and that would help me actually fit it into that table of particles, um, but we just don't know the answers yet. Uh, and then another one that I think is important is, is it a thermal relic? In other words, is its abundance in the universe set by some physical process that we can understand? Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a moment. So I'm going to specialize in this talk. And for most of it, I'm just going to focus on a class of dark matter particles um, that are particularly amenable to being looked for using techniques from particle physics. So my attitude going into this uh, is that I'm looking at these types of particles largely because I can say something about them. Um, it, they are very interesting, and I'll explain why they're interesting, but that doesn't mean that they're the only option. So a WIMP stands for Weakly Interacting Massive Particle. I think everybody knows that. Um, the next slide will show how they can naturally account for the amount of dark matter we observe in the universe. So that's actually where most of their allure comes from. Um, they do occur in many of our favorite theories of physics beyond the standard model, like, for example, supersymmetric extensions, if they have R parity. 
Um, but I'm actually not going to focus very much on the specifics of that. Uh, if it turns out the dark matter is the result of supersymmetry, I'll be very excited. If it turns out the dark matter is the result of something other than supersymmetry, I will be equally excited. Basically, my attitude is the dark matter is something out there and that it behooves us to try to understand it. Uh, and so I'm going to treat dark matter as something we should talk about in and of itself rather than as a byproduct of other types of things. So what I will show you, however, is that that doesn't actually throw everything to the wind and ignore all theoretical input. We actually need a theoretical framework in order to put experimental results into context. And so that's really what the theme of this talk is. Of course, once we have data, then we can use it to figure out how to connect the dark matter to a more fundamental theory. So you've probably realized at this point that I like images that you can find with Google on the internet. It turns out you can buy bo bottles of dark matter. It costs about $60 for 20 servings. It's about this big. Unfortunately, it doesn't tell you how many particles are inside it, so the fundamental mass is still not determined. Uh, it comes in three flavors, blue raspberry, fruit punch, and grape. If it turns out that dark matter has three versions or flavors the way ordinary matter does, I want everyone to promise to lobby very hard to make these the flavors that we call it by. Uh, I have a colleague in Korea who actually bought it. So it turns out that it builds muscle mass, so I guess it's good for wimps or something. Um, but so I have a colleague in Korea who bought it. He let his children <laughs> eat it. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, and what he tells me is that it tastes absolutely disgusting. <laughs> I think he probably could have guessed that given the flavors that were available, but <laughs> that's on him. Um, so basically, I'm going to talk mostly about wimps. I'm going to tell you why wimps are exciting. So the main reason why WIMPs are exciting is something that usually goes by the very uh, ponderous name of the WIMP miracle. I don't think there's anything particularly miraculous about it, um, but I will explain it uh, using the, that language. So the WIMP miracle is just an attractive picture which explains one possible story for why we see the amount of dark matter in the universe that we uh, observe. Uh, and so it's a very nice picture where the, the density of the dark matter today is really just connected with its fundamental interactions with other particles. So the picture starts out with the WIMP in chemical equilibrium with the standard model plasma at some early time when the universe is very hot. Here's a cartoon of that. We've got standard model in red. We've got WIMPs in purple. Uh, and during this period, if the interactions between these two species are strong enough, chemical equilibrium is maintained by scattering of the dark matter particles. So there's, these are written as chi, so two chi's going into some standard model stuff. And of course, equilibrium implies that just as often that's going in the other direction. Standard model stuff is going into Kai Kai. So while it's in equilibrium, and once the temperature falls below its mass, the WIMP number density follows the Boltzmann distribution. Um, so that's down here at the bottom for anyone who doesn't remember it. But really, the important thing here is that, of course, as the temperature gets small compared to the mass of the particles, there are not very many of them here, because much more often you're going to have the WIMPs annihilating into the standard model. And the typical standard model things don't actually have enough energy to produce dark matter, and so the equilibrium density falls exponentially. So this rate is sort of the important thing. If that were the whole story, then it would be very boring, because the universe would just keep expanding, the dark matter would keep diluting, there would be nothing left, um, and it would be irrelevant. But actually, uh, because the universe uh, is expanding itself, eventually this results in a loss of equilibrium. So as the universe expands, eventually we get to a point where the dark matter can't find each other anymore, the interaction is not strong enough for this particle to find somebody who may be way over here in the diagram. Uh, and so at that point, the dark matter basically stops following equilibrium densities. Uh, it freezes out. So at that temperature that that happens, uh, the WIMPs are diluted. They don't annihilate anymore with each other. And basically, we're just stuck with that much dark matter at that point. There's nothing else we can do to get rid of it. So the temperature at which the freeze out happens depends very sensitively on that cross section. That tells us basically how far apart or how rarefied the WIMPs in the universe have to be before they stop interacting with each other. Um, a more strongly interacting WIMP will stay in equilibrium longer and therefore will end up with actually a smaller density of particles. It's a little bit counterintuitive. More strong interactions mean less particles left over. Um, a more weakly interacting WIMP will fall out of equilibrium faster and there'll be more of it left over. So if you put those words into equations, you can solve a Boltzmann equation. Um, this is shown as the variable x, which is the mass of the particle divided by the temperature. So since the mass is presumably not changing, x increasing is temperature decreasing, or in other words, time increasing as the universe expands. 
And then in arbitrary units, we have the density of the dark matter um, plotted on the y-axis. The equilibrium curve is shown here as the solid line, and so that's the exponential suppression we would see if we just let um, the dark matter stay in equilibrium. But then at some point, if you, do, if you solve the, the equation numerically, you leave the equilibrium curve and end up with a essentially flat uh, residual amount of dark matter. And where exactly that happens depends on the cross-section that keeps it in equilibrium. So as I make the cross-section bigger, as advertised, I end up with less dark matter at the end of the day. So that's actually in itself very interesting. The observed quantity of dark matter is suggestive of a cross-section for annihilation into the thermal bath. In other words, that cross-section in some sense is suggested by the fact that by the amount of dark matter that we see today. And of course, there's nothing to tell me that this story actually happened. We haven't seen any ingredient of it yet. Uh, it's just a very nice picture, and it just explains why this is where I start thinking about dark matter. If it turned out it were golf balls, I would be really happy. Um, ideally, what we would like to do is measure the WIMP interactions with the standard model. That would allow us to actually compute this cross-section and then check to see if the relic density turns out to be the density that we measure. I think that's the right way to see this in context. We want to understand how dark matter interacts with ordinary matter and then use that to see if our picture of cosmology is correct, or in other words, if the story I just told you is actually true or not. Um, of course, if they do check out, we have some indirect evidence that our extrapolation backwards to an early time when the universe was hotter is actually working. We'd actually be able to then talk about cosmology with uh, a bit more confidence back to the time of the freeze out at least. Of course, if it doesn't check out, then that means there must be something else happening. Uh, and this could just be as simple as the cosmology itself follows a history that we haven't anticipated. Maybe there are new particles that come into the game. There are actually lots of ways that that could happen. But at least it would tell us something. But of course, the first step is to actually rediscover dark matter by seeing it interact through some force other than gravity, right? Remember, dark matter is fully discovered at this point. Uh, astronomical observation tells us that the dark matter is there. Uh, what we would like to do, though, is see some sign that interacts with ordinary matter. And of course, along the way of doing that, it would tell you which standard model particles dark matter likes to talk to, and in some cases, stuff about the spin, the mass, and so forth. So diagrammatically, the point is we'd like to know how the dark matter interacts with other particles that are in the standard model of particle physics. We have different types of observations that we use to try to learn about those things. So I'm going to actually say a little bit about these types of observations. So there are sort of four big ways that we're looking for trying to learn some of the fundamental physics of dark matter uh, at this moment. Um, three of them are largely particle physics based, and one of them is more based on um, astronomy. So the particle based ones start with indirect detection. So this is the idea that even if the dark matter is no longer efficiently annihilating today because it froze out in the early universe, there are big overdensities of dark matter called galaxies. Um, there, the dark matter density is high enough that maybe you could actually see this process still happening. Uh, and so we happen to live inside a galaxy, and the idea is that you might see particles produced in this process, and if they were interesting enough, they might stick out against the background of other particles that you can see. Um, the cartoon here is the Fermi Large Area Telescope, which looks for gamma rays. Direct detection looks for dark matter coming in and scattering with a standard model target. Um, this is not actually a picture of a detector, but it's the picture of the outside of a lab that's deep underground where such a detector lives, where there's a big vat of xenon that's actually being held in between the liquid and the gas phase um, as a way of trying to look for dark matter coming in and scattering off of xenon nuclei. Uh, and then, of course, something that there's a lot of expertise in this particular room, you could also take the standard model uh, particles and try to produce dark matter in a laboratory if you have a high energy beam of these particles. So these are searches at colliders, like the Large Hadron Collider. Um, and of course, this is also a very interesting way to try to look at dark matter. If you look at these three processes, you can see that they're all more or less the same thing. The only difference is basically how time is flowing. If I start with dark matter and end up with a standard model, that's annihilation. If dark matter and standard model both come in and both go out, that's scattering. Uh, and if standard model comes in and dark matter goes out, that's production at a collider. Now, the last thing that, that has become a very interesting um, subject to learn about the fundamental properties of dark matter is actually asking about dark matter interacting with itself. So this is uh, a way that dark matter could distribute energy, for example, inside a galaxy. It would, might change the way the galaxies form. And so precise measurements of the structures of galaxies could teach us something about dark matter. 
And uh, here to exemplify this, uh, I have what is now called, I guess, the Vera Rubin uh, telescope. This is the first time since that I've given this talk since that happened. Um, I call it LSST. <laughs> So I'm going to say a little bit about each one of these and then talk a little bit about how to put this together into a picture of what theory tells us they're all, te all these experiments tell us together. Um, of course, as you know, none of, there are no um, conclusive signs of dark matter in any of these experiments uh, yet. Well, I guess there's conclusive signs that dark matter exists in galaxies, but no conclusive sign that there's anything interesting in its scattering so far. Um, so it's going to be more about how you take null results and put them together to learn about the, the particle that you're not seeing. So I'm going to start with indirect detection. Indirect detection, remember, is dark matter annihilating into standard model particles. Um, so for example, in our galaxy, occasionally they may meet each other, annihilate into standard model particles, which make their way to the Earth where we, de where we detect them. So in particular, photons and neutrinos are very exciting messengers that they may produce. Um, this is because they both interact very weakly with the uh, interstellar medium inside the galaxy, and so when you detect them on the Earth, you have a pretty good idea where they came from, and that gives you a handle, basically, to figure out where they were produced. Charged particles could also be very interesting, um, but because of the magnetic fields in the galaxy, they get deflected on their way to us. We don't actually have as good an idea, or in many cases, we don't have any idea what direction they come from, and so you lose that handle. And so here's the Fermi Large Area Telescope again, looking for gamma rays. This is a picture of the gamma ray sky that it sees. This is the galactic plane, which is pretty bright in gamma rays. And here are some pictures of Ice Cube, which are looking for high-energy neutrinos at the South Pole. The rate that you would see in a detector is described by some cross-section that tells you how the dark matter annihilates, right? That's that same cross-section that we were hoping explained the amount of dark matter in the universe. So that depends on what the model is. It also depends on the density of the dark matter squared at the place where they're annihilating, and that's because you need two particles to annihilate. Um, once they annihilate, they may produce a whole bunch of different standard model particles. These typically all cascade down and give us gamma rays, maybe from pi zero decays, neutrinos, maybe from charged pion decays, or also charged particles. And this is a simulation of what you might hope to see looking towards the center of our galaxy. The center is here in the center of the image. Um, if the dark matter were annihilating with the cross-section that you expect from the density. So I just wanted to say one thing uh, about this before I move on to another way of looking for dark matter. There is actually an interesting mystery going on right now. It's not a conclusive sign that dark matter is actually there, um, but there is actually an excess of GeV gamma rays that's seen towards the galactic center. Um, this is the data without doing any modeling of the backgrounds. When they take out all their knowledge of what prosaic processes are producing uh, GeV gamma rays, you end up with actually sort of a bright spot. These are in different energy bands. So this is below a GeV. This is at around a GeV or a few GeV. And this is up to about 10 GeV that's left behind at the center of the galaxy. So this is a signal that looks kind of like what you would expect dark matter to look like if it were annihilating and producing photons. It's in the place where you'd expect it to be doing it. But that said, um, if you look at sort of this messy background and then you subtract it, you're left with this little blob, you know, it's, it's not totally believable that you understand the background well enough to do this mapping. And so I think it's still really an open question whether or not this is a signal of dark matter annihilating or not. Um, but it's a fun thing to look at and, and we should just keep watching it. Now, the sad thing is that there's currently no instrument plan that is probably going to resolve this mystery, so we're going to have to live with it for a while. Um, the best hope is that maybe what is producing the excess is something like pulsars, and maybe we'll detect the pulsars. But other than that, I don't think it's going to be resolved by just gamma ray data. So moving on to direct detection, dark matter scattering with a nucleus. Right, the basic strategy is that you look for the low energy recoil of a heavy nucleus when the dark matter brushes against it. Um, this is looking for the dark matter that's floating around us in our galaxy's halo. Um, a positive signal is really a direct observation for it. So the dark matter comes in. There's some shielding around it, so you can see if some other particle comes in. It interacts with the nucleus, which then starts moving or jiggling or something, and that produces energy that can be read out as a signal. The dark matter goes out again without um, interacting with anything else. So it's very crucial that you have heavy shielding around this kind of experiment. Right? If you don't, then these other particles, random particles, are going to come in and fool you into thinking you have a signal. Um, usually this is accomplished by putting these detectors very far underground. Uh, and 
the searches are rapidly advancing. There's orders of magnitude improvements in sensitivity every few years. <coughs> this is actually a picture of the, um, the xenon experiment, um, which is uh, a vat of uh, xenon. <laughs> yeah. On the previous slide. Sure. Uh, you've got an estimate of the number density. They've got a, a value of the rate. And so they know the cross section. Yep. And uh, they know the coupling of something that's 40 GPU. And they're all, they're all in the particle physicists. So it, it, exactly why haven't we seen it? Uh, they arranged this so that we can see it. Seen you mean it. haven't seen it somewhere else? Well, it, it's going to be a problem. It's going to be a number for the coupling constant. Yep. 40 GPV, would the explanation be that it simply doesn't talk to the standard model? No, it does talk to the standard model. It has to to produce the photons ultimately. Um, yeah, so you can build particle physics models. Um, I don't know exactly how to how to give one, you know, in the way that would be obviously interpretable. The cross section, though, is very close to that thermal relic cross section. That means it's roughly an electroweak size cross section. Then we would have seen it. Not necessarily. That's the interesting thing. But you can build models where you haven't seen it, where you wouldn't have expected to. But you're right that, I mean, if you just took a model at random, then there's a good chance you might have seen it because the mass is not that heavy. The LHC can produce it, so on and so forth. So the rate of direct detection depends on one power of the dark matter density close to the Earth. That's the dark matter we're trying to see. It also depends on some nuclear physics form factors and the distribution of the dark matter velocity. Um, so there's an energy spectrum of the recoil in the nucleus. You could hope to try to match that on to some uh, theory of dark matter. Um, the cross-section is dominated by the effective interactions with quarks and gluons, the parts of the standard model that contribute to heavy nuclei. And there's actually a very interesting handle on the signal that comes from an annual modulation. The idea is basically, you know, the dark matter is not really moving relative to our galaxy. If you want to go by mass, the dark matter is our galaxy. But we're moving with regard to the galaxy. And so as the sun's moving um, roughly around the, the galactic center, it effectively sees a wind of dark matter coming towards it in its rest frame. Uh, but the Earth, of course, is also moving around the sun. And so for half of the year, it's moving together with the sun and sees a larger effective velocity. And for the other half of the year, it's moving against the sun and it sees a smaller effective velocity. So actually, the rate of dark matter you'd expect to see has a sinusoidal dependence with a period of a year. Um, and that's an interesting handle you could use to try to understand whether or not the signal you're seeing is actually dark matter or not. Um, now, because of the rotation of the Earth, there's also actually a daily modulation. But that's thought to be small enough that it's probably going to be hard to use, but maybe not impossible in every case. And there are two distinct classes of, of direct searches for dark matter. Uh, basically, it just depends on how you write down the Hamiltonian for dark matter interacting uh, with a nucleon. Um, if, the in, if the interaction is independent of the spins of the two particles, and actually I don't even know if dark matter has a spin, so um, that may actually be kind of a moot question, um, then you come in, you scatter with one of the nucleons inside your nucleus, you go out. Um, because the momentum transfer is very low, actually the dark matter's wave function doesn't resolve the individual nucleons inside the nucleus, it actually sees the entire nucleus coherently. And so if that's the case, there's a big enhancement of this cross-section because it just looks like a big ball of charge that the dark matter would like to interact with. On the other hand, if the interaction is through the spin of the dark matter interacting with the spin of the nucleons, then this translates into the interaction of the spin of the dark matter with the spin of the nucleus. Uh, there, there's no large enhancement. There's no coherent enhancement in that case. Uh, and so typically, you get somewhat weaker bounds if the interactions are spin dependent. So the two big things you see in direct detection searches are, are they looking for spin independent uh, scattering or spin dependent scattering? Many detectors can do both at the same time. Uh, but of course, if your nucleus that is your target doesn't have a spin, obviously you can't talk about the spin dependent one. Xenon, it turns out, is an amazing nucleus that has stable isotopes. I don't know how many there are, but like about 10 or something. It's really weird. Um, so actually, the, the big xenon detectors can do both of these because while a lot of xenon is in the, an isotope that is, does not have a spin, uh, about half of it actually does have a spin that you can use. Um, these experiments are showing a lot of activity. This is a plot that's in the mass of the dark matter on the x-axis and the interaction of the dark matter with a nucleon. So they've unfolded the nuclear physics in making this plot on the y-axis. 
Um, you can see different experiments are shown here as the solid lines. And actually, um, even since this plot was made, a couple more have come online. Uh, we're down here sort of to around the xenon one ton line. So actually, the current situation looks something like that. It's taking a big bite into this parameter space. Uh, you can see a feature that all of the experiments have some difficulty at low masses, and that's because if the dark matter is too light, it just can't give enough momentum to the nucleus for you to notice that it's scattering, uh, and that means it's very hard to be sensitive. There, are, there is a program now to try to push into that regime, so that's something that's undergoing, that we're going through right now. And of course, there are programs to build even bigger detectors of the same kind that we've been building here to push down. Now, at some point, actually, neutrinos, which up until now have been kind of a background that you can ignore, are going to become relevant. And at some point, these detectors are no longer going to be really dark matter searches. They're going to be neutrino detectors. That's exciting in itself. You could learn something maybe about the background of atmospheric and um, supernova neutrinos uh, that we live in. But of course, that will complicate looking for dark matter. It won't make it impossible, but it will make it harder because you'll go to a, a regime where you have um, a lot of background. You may wonder why the neutrino background seems to depend on the dark matter mass. It doesn't, right? But remember, the dark matter mass turns into a distribution of energies of the recoil, and the neutrinos also turn into a distribution of energies for the recoil. So effectively, this curve, when traced in this parameter space, does actually have a dependence on the mass. And then the last type of search I'd like to talk about is collider production. Uh, if the dark matter couples to quarks or gluons, we should also be able to produce it at high energy colliders like the LHC. Plus, they're so beautiful. Um, so this is ATLAS and this is CMS, or at least parts of them. Um, by studying the production and collisions of standard model particles, you're actually looking at the inverse of the annihilation process that we were hoping kept the WIMPs in equilibrium in the early universe. And provided they have enough energy to produce them, colliders can actually maybe produce even other particles that are part of a dark sector uh, and are no longer present in the universe today. So maybe the dark matter has friends and the colliders can actually look for the friends too. Um, part of the point in showing these images is that these are, I think, arguably the most sophisticated devices that exist. They have many, many different detectors for detecting many, many different things. Um, none of them, however, are sensitive to WIMPs. WIMPs fly right through them and don't stop. So that means that when you look for dark matter at a collider, you have to look, at, look for it uh, based on its absence. It interacts so weakly that it is probably going to pass through the detectors without any significant interaction. So they're like neutrinos, effectively invisible. Uh, nonetheless, you can try to see something. So for example, if you pair, if you produce a pair of dark matter particles along with something that is visible, then you might see the visible particle, but uh, there's an imbalance in the momentum between the visible radiation and the dark matter that you didn't see. So at that point, you either conclude one of two things. Either momentum is not conserved, probably not since we teach that in freshman physics, or there was something being produced that your detector didn't see. And that's uh, the interpretation you'd make. Similarly, you might imagine that you produce some of the partners of the dark matter, which then may be decay into the dark matter and uh, some visible things. And again, you could see an imbalance in the momentum uh, between the, of the visible stuff, and that's because you're not accounting for the momentum carried by the dark matter. This is usually called a missing energy signal. I find that deeply frustrating because, as I said, <laughs> it's not energy, it's momentum. You don't actually know how much energy came in in the initial particles, so you can't tell whether energy is missing. You can only tell whether momentum is. So we've seen a bunch of different techniques to look for dark matter. Um, so these were looking for annihilations from the, the Fermi Large Area Telescope. I didn't actually show this slide. Um, here were the searches for dark matter scattering um, with nuclei. Uh, this is a different plot showing uh, dark matter searches at, at CMS being produced uh, at the LHC. All three of them we know are trying to measure the same thing. They're all trying to tell us something about how dark matter interacts with the standard model. So therefore, in some sense, there's at least one axis of this plot that should be somehow at least related in each one of them. The mass is usually, so the mass is the x-axis of these two plots. It's actually the y-axis of this plot. I guess CMS was feeling contrarian. But the point is, is that if they're all related to each other, then we should know how they connect to each other. And they should all be telling us something that puts put together gives us a better picture. In order to be able to relate them to each other, though, I need a theory. I need to have something that tells me what the cross-section is in terms of some more fundamental parameter, right, which is going to be the same for all of the experiments. Uh, and the question is which theory to use. 
Now, luckily, theoretical physicists do not have a difficulty writing down theories. This is actually a plot by Sasha Believ. It shows you the number of papers per year on different topics. This actually includes experimental papers, I should say, in particle physics. Uh, you can see that supersymmetry, of course, was going very strong. The Higgs has jumped up. This plot ends sort of a little bit after the Higgs discovery. Top physics got a big boost sort of around the top quark discovery, and it's also going strong. Extra dimensions on the way out. Uh, dark matter is actually, uh, in recent years, one of the most big topics. And partly that's because of all the different experimental searches that are going on, and partly it's because there's so many theoretical ideas for what dark matter could be. So I actually tried to organize the different theories of dark matter that had been written down. Uh, what I came up with looks something like this. This is a Venn diagram. Each one of these blobs is a different theory for what the dark matter could be. It actually came about because one of my experimental colleagues was asking me what the difference between the PMSSM and the NMSSM was. So <laughs> then I tried to explain it to him and he said, I don't get this, can you make a Venn diagram? And I said, okay. This is what came out. Um, I'm not sure if its value is largely in the realm of abstract art or physics, but, uh, but I was happy with it, I have to say. Um, it does answer the question that the PMSSM is actually a subset of the NMSSM. So I did actually manage to answer that. It's sort of a weird Venn diagram, and the reason is, is that everything is crowding towards the center because I've left off the most important circle of all. Right? These are all theories of dark matter, and that's why it crowds together in this way. So there are no lack of options. Yeah. Uh, um, that is probably true. It is woefully incomplete. I have to say, if I were to do this exercise again, I'm not sure I would do it. <laughs> um, and I would probably actually try to organize things totally differently because I've learned a few things since then. Um, it's true, though, that, uh, for example, primordial black holes definitely belongs on this chart. Uh, and it's not there. Oh, uh, modified gravity, that's true, that's true. Um, in fact, modified gravity would be the only thing that wouldn't overlap with the dark matter, perhaps. So I don't really have anything to say about modified gravity other than that I think it's actually an interesting question, and uh, I would like us to frame it a bit more scientifically in terms of, we have this dominant paradigm of dark matter. What I'd like to do is then put the modified gravity on top of it, and then ask the question, how much degeneracy is there? How much modified gravity do you need? You know, people focus a lot on can you completely replace dark matter with modified gravity. This is hard to do, at least in early cosmology. It, it's more successful in rotation curves and stuff. Um, but I mean, I, I, I would be perfectly willing to add that. <laughs> OK, so in the last um, 20 minutes or so, uh, what I'd like to do is then talk a little bit about how I organize uh, this plethora of theories. So what I'm not going to do is spend my time giving you one slide about each one of these. This would be very boring even for me, and I don't think it would actually leave anything that would stay with you. So what I'm going to try to do instead is classify the theories based on how complete they are. Um, so complete basically just refers to what can you compute with this theory? Would you trust what it tells you to compute, say, at the Large Hadron Collider, dark matter annihilation? Would you trust it to tell you what happens if you were to get to the energies of the gut scale? That's the kind of uh, question that I'm asking. So on one end of this axis of completeness, you have models that are really very complete. And the best example of that is actually the supersymmetric theories, like the MSSM, the Minimal Supersymmetric Standard Model. These theories, in principle, could describe everything all the way up to maybe the gut scale or even the Planck scale. Um, there's no question that these theories can't answer. Um, on the other end of the axis, you have much more simplified theories where instead of trying to write down a complete model that you think might describe nature all the way up to very high energies, instead you just try to write down a sketch of a model that hopefully contains some of the most important ingredients, the dark matter, maybe some of the things it talks to, but maybe not the whole picture, right? And maybe these theories just represent some kind of caricature of actually something that is more complete. In fact, almost certainly that's what it should be doing. In the very extreme limit, you get to effective field theories where you just say, well, there's dark matter. It interacts with the standard model, full stop. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about each one of these three regions, the most complete theories, the simplified models, which are sort of a hybrid, 
and the least complete theories, because I think they all tell you something about this question. When I take all the experimental data and I put it together, what does it tell me about dark matter? I'm going to start with the complete theories. I'm going to spend exactly one slide on them. The most famous complete theory is the supersymmetric standard model. Um, you've probably seen particle fever. Uh, I actually worked with David Kaplan when we were postdocs at Argonne, so I have a soft spot in my heart for the movie. Um, they actually show, had this nice quasi-crystal representation of the supersymmetric standard model. Uh, the dark matter lives here. Um, it's the obvious first place to start because it's a theory that's been around long before we actually were sure that there was dark matter. I mean, we had good indications uh, from people like Zwicky and Rubin, but it wasn't really pinned down to the point that it was uh, completely accepted. So this theory has been around for a long time. It does have particles that can play the role of dark matter. And the problem is, is that a complete theory has to describe everything. And in this case, it means the theory has about 100 parameters. 100 parameters is a lot. Uh, it's very hard to actually know where to look. There are definitely islands of this parameter space, different islands, disconnected islands, radically different physics in the islands, that actually have a dark matter candidate that could explain what we observe. So they're all, in principle, something that could at least be true from the point of view of dark matter. Um, even if I try to boil this down to say, let's just talk about the reasonable parameters or the important parameters, you get down to about 20. 20 parameters is still a lot. Um, it's very hard to actually know what to do with it. So the most common thing that's been done recently is to say, let me just actually use Monte Carlo to explore the parameter space and see what I find. Let me just do a scan of some kind. This is one particular result of a scan like that. Um, each dot in this plot is actually a different model a different parameter point of the supersymmetric standard model. Uh, I'll tell you the color coding in a second. And then what they've done is they projected that point, right, which lives in a 20-dimensional parameter space, onto an axis of the, the mass of the dark matter. That's clearly something I care about. Uh, and then the cross-section for it to interact uh, with nucleons, that direct detection cross-section. And then the color coding is showing you which types of experiments are capable of discovering this particular point. Uh, the green and the red are both things that can be discovered by xenon one ton. And they show a very clear correlation in this parameter space, right? The green and the red are all above this line that indicates the future reach of xenon one ton. That's not shocking because you've projected exactly onto the axis that that experiment uses to describe its results. Um, what's a bit more interesting, though, is that the red points, in addition to being able to be discovered by xenon, could actually be seen at an upgrade of the ice cube detector by producing high energy neutrinos. The blue points also would be visible at ice cube. So the red and the blue are both different in a little bit way. And then it's interesting to see that this actually, the, the models that ice cube can tell you something about are the heavy ones. The ones where the mass of the dark matter is bigger than maybe 700 GeV or so. And thinking about ice cube, which has a very stiff trigger on the neutrinos it can detect, it's not too shocking, actually, that that would be the case, that higher mass particles produce more energetic neutrinos and therefore are easier to detect. The purple dots are the ones that can be discovered by the LHC, but not by xenon or ice cube. Some of these dots over here in the green, red, and blue could also be discovered by the LHC. So the purple dots actually show that the LHC is doing something very important to fill in a region of parameter space that's harder to cover with the other types of experiments. Uh, in fact, you also see that it favors lower mass dark matter particles. Again, that's not shocking. The LHC has a limited amount of energy. If you can't produce the particles, you can't talk about them. Though actually, the energy of the LHC is such that it could potentially produce these particles, but the cross-sections tend to be a little on the small side. Now, what's hard to see probably from where you're sitting is that there's also a bunch of gray dots. The gray dots are the dots that nobody can discover. So again, something you might hope to learn from this exercise is what is it that makes these dots hard to discover, and could you actually devise new strategies to find them? And I'm actually happy to say that this study, which was done in 2013, was updated where they actually looked at some of the newer search strategies to look for missing momentum at the LHC, and they actually found that now they can detect something like 99.99% of all the dots. So the LHC will eventually get here. In fact, I think it probably already has gotten here. But. All right, then I want to jump to the other end of the axis, and talk about the most primitive theories of dark matter interacting with ordinary matter. So on the simple end of the spectrum, you can imagine the dark matter is the only particle that's accessible to our experiments. So maybe the dark matter likes to interact, say, with quarks by exchanging a colored particle, 
So this is something that in the supersymmetry you'd call a squark. I'm going to be agnostic about what it is. But the point is, is that if this particle is very heavy, then the details of how the dark matter interacts with quarks is not important. And you just end up with some meta theory where the dark matter has some blob interaction with the quarks. And then you can write down all of the types of interactions between dark matter and quarks that are consistent with the symmetries of the standard model. Here they are. There are 10 of them. Um, the details don't matter, so sorry for giving you the technical gobbledygook. But the point is, is that if you want to write down a Majorana dark matter particle interacting with quarks or gluons, there are 10 leading interactions you have to think about. And this table just tells you how to reconstruct them. So each one of these interactions, in principle, has some separate coefficient that tells you how strong that interaction uh, is. And if you had some realistic theory of dark matter, some realistic complete theory of dark matter, it should turn on some combinations of these interactions in some correlated way based on its parameters. So the various types of interactions, it turns out, are accessible to different kinds of experiments. So for example, if I'm interested in spin-independent elastic scattering, uh, it turns out that only two of these interactions are actually probed by that type of search. So the direct detection experiments, which are usually lauded as the sort of best searches for dark matter we have, and in fact are responsible for this um, hand-wringing you sometimes see where people say that WIMPs are dead, are actually only sensitive to two types of interactions. If nature has given us some combination of the rest of them, but not these two, M1 and M7, then these experiments are not telling us very much. They're still saying something. So th they don't see no rate with the other ones, but they see a very suppressed rate. The spin-dependent scattering is actually just this one. So the direct experiments are actually very sensitive to three of these types of interactions. Uh, annihilation is sensitive to four of them. And kind of interestingly enough, it's four that were not probed by direct detection. So that tells you that actually this way, these two ways of looking for things, looking for scattering, looking for annihilation, are complementary to each other. They both have a strength, which is where the other one does not work very well. Also notice, though, that there are a few interactions, um, for example, like M9, which is not really sensitive to either one of them. And the interesting thing about the LHC is that the collider production doesn't really favor one or the others, but it actually does all of them fairly equivalently. So the LHC is really important for filling in the gaps that are left behind by the other experiments. And that's one way to look at it. Uh, this doesn't say anything at all about the masses of the particles. This is just looking at the types of interactions they could have. So already, I think this exercise teaches me something important. All the ways we were looking for dark matter were in some ways complementing each other, and they kind of were all necessary if you wanted to cover the space. So I realized I'm really far behind. <laughs> Um, you can actually map each interaction into a prediction for WIMPs annihilating. So you could imagine this is a dark matter interacting with gluons. I can look at the dark matter interacting to gluons cross-section, so the annihilation cross-section normalized by the cross-section that would give me the right abundance of dark matter. Right? So I'd like to live right here. I get too little dark matter if I make the cross-section too big. I get too much dark matter if I make the cross-section smaller. And then you can contrast different ways of looking for dark matter on this plot. So the direct searches are shown as this black solid line. Um, there's some shape here because there's more than one experiment that's actually been put together. This is just the shadow of all of them. Um, the colliders are shown by the red line. Uh, you can see that the colliders actually do very well at low masses. Remember, at low masses, direct detection had a problem. Colliders fill that in as well. This is independent of the way that it's interacting. Direct detection does pretty well right where it's designed to, around 10 to 100 GeV. Indirect detection doesn't particularly do well with gluons because gluons don't lead to visible particles in those detectors. And I think because of the time, I'll sort of skip this, but you can do this exercise again for dark matter interacting with quarks or with leptons, and you can see the, the shifting around of how colliders do, how direct detection does, and how indirect detection does. So in the middle of the axis of completeness, we had the simplified models. Um, Here's a simple example of a simplified model where we introduce the dark matter and a force carrier that lets the dark matter interact with, um, with quarks um, and nothing else. So this is not necessarily a complete theory. There's still lots of questions like, how did this new force carrier get its mass? Does it have some kind of dark Higgs? What am I supposed to do with that? Um, but the theory is now very simple. I really only have three parameters to play with. We have actually four in some sense, but we have 
the dark matter's mass, right, which could be either heavier or lighter than the standard model. We have the mediator mass, which could be heavier or lighter than the dark matter. And then we have something that characterizes the interactions between the, the mediator and the standard model or the dark matter. So going to some of the LHC searches that we talked about, like the monojet searches, you can imagine that what the LHC is actually looking for is dark matter, is quarks coming in, they radiate off some kind of visible radiation. So this is labeled X here, but in my case, I'm really thinking that this is a jet of hadrons. It produces the mediator particle, and then this mediator will either decay back into dark matter, or decay into dark matter, which would produce missing momentum, this visible stuff recoiling against the missing momentum, or it could also decay into the standard model. Um, and I'll show you that on the next slide. So here are some plots from both ATLAS and CMS. On one axis, we have the mass of the mediator particle, so the mass of this uh, force carrier. On the y-axis, we have the mass of the dark matter. And you can see a chunk of parameter space. Well, actually, what I should say first is the, um, the interaction strength is plotted here as the colored shading. So you can see that the, the stronger constraints are actually coming down in this triangle where the mediating particle is being produced on shell. You can actually directly produce the mediator. That gives you a big uh, boost to its cross-section. Uh, and so it rules out a region of parameter space that has actually up to very high mediator masses you know, one or two TeV, and then the dark matter masses sort of have to be correlated with that because I need the dark matter to be light enough for the mediator to decay into it, but the dark matter masses are sort of a few hundred up to maybe about half of a TeV or so. So it's very interesting that you can take a chunk out of the parameter space here using the CMS data, just looking for events with some visible particle recoiling against some invisible dark matter. And the Atlas plot more or less is the same thing. You could interpret that in the language of direct detection, but I don't want to get bogged down on that. What I'd like to talk about more is searching for mediators. So you could also imagine that after you produce the mediator particle, it then decays back into standard model particles. So maybe the quarks give you a mediator, which then gives you quarks again. This will produce a resonant enhancement at the energies where the, ma where the, where the energies of the quarks reconstruct the mass of the new force carrier. And looking for that, we can put a limit on, say, the plane of the mass of this. The mediator is labeled Z prime here. So this is a Z prime uh, mass, and then the coupling to quarks. Uh, and you can see that actually these limits go all the way down from masses at you know, a few tens of GeV up to, at this point, uh, multi-TeV. Um, this particular plot was chosen because it, it, uh, it shows you how some really creative analysis actually allowed them to go below uh, where the triggers nominally would have said they should have uh, had to stop. So they actually have the best limits even at lower masses, which other colliders you would have thought would have covered already. And this is a similar plot from, Atla from Atlas. In the limit where the dark matter, uh, where, the where the dark mediator is very light, it's usually called the dark photon. Um, so if you make the mediator very light, then uh, you can think about it as a dark photon. I don't want to say too much about that, except to just say that there's a very rich experimental program of trying to produce dark photons and then watch them decay. So here they're decaying into dark matter, which would also have to be very light, or here they're decaying into ordinary matter. Um, there's a lot of knowledge that comes from existing experiments and a lot of proposed experiments here that are trying to fill in the gap where the mass down here is sort of of order uh, maybe 100 MeV or 10 MeV or something. And the couplings are very, very small, which explains why you haven't seen it already. All right, I think because of the time, I'm not going to tell you about colored mediators. I'd be happy to talk about that afterwards. Um, I will really quickly say that astronomical probes are also super important. We would like to know if the dark matter interacts with itself. Um, we know, of course, the dark matter um, explains large-scale structure very successfully. But it might be that the smaller distance scales, the smaller scales of structure could be influenced if the dark matter can redistribute its energy through a process like this one. Uh, there are bounds on how much this is allowed to happen from things like the bullet cluster, where we know dark matter did collide with itself at some level, but we can't see any indication uh, that anything happened when that, that happened. There's some controversial evidence that this may help simulation better describe observation, but there's also big systematics on the measurements, so I'm not really going to uh, belabor that point. But basically, the idea is if you were to do a simulation where the dark matter interacts with itself, uh, the large scale structures would look pretty much identical, but the self interacting case would look sort of more puffy and diffuse because of the exchange of energy. 
uh, than the ordinary collisionless dark matter would look like, which would have bigger concentrations in the centers. Uh, and there's a very nice review article by Buckley and Peter uh, that sort of describe um, the inter interaction strengths of baryons versus the scale of interesting structures in the universe and where your favorite models may land um, there. So I'm going to take five more minutes <laughs> and tell you what a discovery could look like. Here's my source. Um, Doctor Who's a woman now, in case you didn't notice. Uh, so this, of course, is going to be personal and it's going to be very optimistic, but you know, why be pessimistic? What's the point of that? So what I'm going to do is sort of trace through what you could imagine might happen in the next few years and how it would fill in my questionnaire, right? So we start off here where, where we are today. We know that dark matter interacts with gravity. That's it. So the first thing I'm going to imagine is that Xenon 1 ton, which is running right now actually in the Gran Sasso laboratory in Italy, sees a handful of elastic scattering events consistent with a dark matter mass less than about 400 GeV. That's going to be very exciting for LHC experimentalists because they know that that mass range is something that they can probe uh, with LHC data. So now we've seen dark matter scattering with nuclei. That means it must couple to quarks or gluons. And we know the mass is less than about 400 GeV or so. Otherwise, we can't explain the spectrum of recoils that we got there. Then the next thing I'm going to imagine is that CTA, which is a future gamma ray observatory <coughs> scheduled to go online in the next few years, actually sees a faint gamma ray line at 350 GeV coming from the galactic center. That actually tells us that the mass of the dark matter is, yes, less than 400, but actually about 350. But they have an energy resolution of about 10%, so it's still plus or minus 50 or so. It doesn't really help fill in the couplings very well. Uh, now I'll imagine that, uh, first of all, direct detection keeps seeing a signal, so we're pretty sure that this is a real one. But more interestingly, two of the LHC experiments see a significant excess of leptons plus missing energy. So I said missing energy, I'm sorry, it's missing momentum. Um, that leaves a question open, because while we know that it interacts with quarks and gluons, and that's why the LHC could produce it, we're still not sure if it's through the weak interaction or if it just likes to talk to leptons directly. Both of these things could have given us this signal. Um, but if you look at some of the other signals that were possible at the LHC, if you don't see jets plus missing energy, that would tell you it's not the weak interaction, because that should do both leptons and jets at the same time. It must be that the dark matter just likes to talk to leptons directly. At the same time, I'm going to imagine that uh, Ice Cube sees some neutrinos coming from the direction of the sun. And for technical reasons, that would actually tell us that the spin of the dark matter is not zero. That would just be a self-consistency with other measurements. So now I'm going to get really optimistic <laughs> and imagine that an axion search, ADMX, also actually sees a positive signal of axion conversion. At that point, we would actually know that there are two kinds of dark matter in the universe. The kind that we've been talking about that looks like a wimp, another kind that looks like an axion. We would actually know a lot about it just from the way ADMX would see the signal. We would know its mass. We would know something about its spin. We would know it interacts with, uh, electromagnet uh, with electromagnetism. It wouldn't actually help us, though, with the other half. And then ultimately, we could imagine that a future Higgs factory, like an E plus E minus future collider, uh, does some very precise measurements. It indicates that interaction with leptons is too strong to saturate the relic density. And at that point, the whole picture makes sense. We have something in the universe that is a wimp, but its interactions are too strong, so it doesn't account for all of the dark matter. And then we have something that looks like an axion that makes up the rest of it. So these experiments would actually help you tease this out. I don't know exactly when this would be built, but it would probably be a bit below 2024, I think. Um, the point is really that a multi-pronged search strategy identifies a mixture of dark matter composed of classic WIMPs and axions. And just with experiments we're planning to build, this is something that could happen, of course, if we get lucky, and the dark matter really does have the properties that I imagined it does here. But nothing I imagined here is ruled out by current data. It's all possible, it's just um, we don't know if it's true or not. So to finish up, dark matter is an interesting phenomenon. It implies physics beyond the standard model of particle physics, and particle physics offers many ways to study it. Understanding the relationship between different searches and how they define the viable parameter space requires a theoretical framework. These could be very concrete, complete models, like the supersymmetric theory, but it could also be fruitful to look at less defined, more hazy sketches of theories as well. There's a, they're a little bit easier to um, interpret. 
So in this context, searches, for, searches at colliders for the scattering with nuclei and for annihilation products all seem to naturally target different parts of dark matter theory space, and so they complement each other. And the full suite of techniques are probably essential to do justice to the range of possibilities. Once you have a discovery, that will ultimately help define and verify um, that dark, what dark matter is, and then help us actually define the new experiments you would need to follow them up. So I guess the message of this talk really is that experiments can bring sketches of dark matter theories to life. So that's what this is supposed to look like. I think Escher anticipated it. Uh, and I'll leave you with my favorite sketch of dark matter. Thank you. So, are there any, is there one quick question? Somebody. And those students have to catch a bus. Sorry for going over. Z prime going to uh, dark matter or quarks. What about leptons? You could very easily do that as well. Um, the bounds tend to be stronger because if you couple to both quarks and leptons, the classic Z prime searches are very effective depending on the mass. Um, but of course, that's allowed and it's possible. You know, in general, you'd think that something like that would probably happen. No. Um, that's right. So the question was about an experiment called DAMA, which is one of the direct detection experiments. Um, oops. So there is actually a claim of an annual modulation that was consistent with a signal of dark matter made by DAMA. This was first claimed, I don't know, in the er mid 2000s, I guess. It's been a long time. Uh, the region of parameter space favored is, there are two regions actually, one here and one down here at lower masses. Uh, to this day, we don't know what causes the DAMA events. We know that they keep seeing an annual modulation even today. Uh, the significance is 10 sigma or something, so it's not statistics that explains it. Um, the question is, is there some kind of systematic that might explain it? Uh, no one has identified a systematic. So the main reason why people don't talk about it very much is just that these experiments that have come since seem to have ruled out naively the parameter space. Now that doesn't mean though that a very creative theorist might not find some way to evade some and, and still keep the other. And as you alluded to, there are now a, a host of experiments that are trying to follow up DAMA with using the same target, which is sodium iodide, uh, and see whether they see anything. So the first round of those, they're actually gonna go into the same cavern as DAMA because if you can't see DAMA there, then there's nothing to do. <laughs> and then after that, you move to the southern hemisphere where the annual modulation um, should stay in phase if it's really dark matter, but should probably flip sign because you know lots of things cause annual modulations, right? But the temperature one at least is different in the southern hemisphere. Uh, Dumbest modulation is exactly in phase and size with the neutron background that they never bothered to find out. So there's a uh, annual modulation of the neutron flux in the ground lines from the atmospheric view on. Right. I published that, and lots of people have piled on. So it's, it's popular enough that people are running with it. Right, right. And of course, the answer is, is to make a small scale Adama in the Southern Hemisphere and find out the seasonal variations exactly. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So sorry, I should have mentioned that. I mean, it, it is actually, um, DAMA itself seems to kind of resist this explanation, but again, they don't really have anything they say that the, contradicts it. The entire community thought that cross-sections for low-energy neutrons incorrect. They, they thought they could, the low-energy neutron was an extrapolation of a high-energy neutron. So they thought the largest the neutron cross-section could be, could be a fraction of a, a bar. Low-energy neutron cross-sections are 100,000 bar. Got a wildly ball. Okay. So that let's thank Tim again.